Hey, welcome to Campfire. In this episode, we're digging on the Triple E framework. We're sharing out our false engagement stories. These are situations where our students were strongly engaged in the technology, but perhaps not the content itself. We also invited Sharon Murchie to chat with us around the campfire. We discussed how she's utilized the Genius Hour model to promote design thinking in her classroom and how that's helping to grow her students' agency in their learning. We also played a game of Would You Rather with her with educationally related themes. You're not going to want to miss out on that. And finally, we flip the Campfire Q segment on its head a little bit. We're asking you the question and we're looking for your responses. So respond to us on social media and we'll incorporate your responses into the next episode of Campfire. All right, on with the show. Do you call it LaCroix? You don't call it LaCroix? <sighs> <laughs> I do. I don't What is that how it's supposed to be pronounced? I don't know. When I see something that looks French, I just put extra Frenchiness in it. So mm-hmm. I just said uh, LaCroix. That's and probably like, pretty close. I did like how you called it LaCroix. Easy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds very Northern Michigan. Like Absolutely. Yeah. Let's not fancify our... <laughs> our flavored sparkling water here. Let's just drink it and call it good. Uh, But it feels summery, right? Yeah, well, that's good for a... It's a really rainy day here, so... It was a rainy rainy morning. It's The blue skies are starting to come out, but it's like this sign that summer is definitely ending, almost over, right? Yeah, and it's, it's back to school back to school time it is back to school so now that um now that we're out of the classroom this is something that's been on my brain lately because i used to have like for a month solid those back to school not nightmares but just bad dreams did you ever have any of those i think summer break is a horrible thing to do to adults because (laughs) i think that it causes so much august anxiety I think the reason why we're getting early school starts is to minimize back to school anxiety for the educators. (laughs) It's an interesting thought process there. I made that up as I just said it. But (laughs) yes, that my short answer is yes. I had horrible like anticipation anxiety as a teacher. I used to stupidly do seating charts without ever meeting any of these students before. I, that wasn't proper English. Are you doing like but, a face palm right now? Yeah, face palm. <laughs> but yeah, lots of uh, bulletin board anxiety, like my room's not ready anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just general, oh, I don't want to go back somewhere. It's so great. <laughs> and then to make matters worse, um Sometimes I still have this. Sometimes I have difficulty going to sleep on Sunday nights. Really? I don't know if you still have it a little bit at all, I, but not nearly as much as I used to. If I go to sleep, it's going to be Monday morning. But if I stay awake, then I can have a couple more moments of weekend. <laughs> nice. It's bad. It's bad. It, it has nothing to do with trying to avoid the children at all. Right. It's just too big of a transition from doing absolutely nothing. Anyway, you triggered something in me. You probably want to talk a little bit about yours. <laughs> did, did, <laughs> did you have <laughs> that situation? Um, mine were just always like these little snippets where I would have to run an errand and, or like run out to grab lunch really fast. And, you know, teachers' lunches are really short anyways. Like my husband always tells me that I eat like a teacher, which is just really fast because, you know, you have lunch break and you're like scarfing your lunch, making copies, going to the bathroom, taking work to the office for a student who's sick. Like it's always just nonstop. And so mm-hmm. I would always have these dreams that I would run out to lunch or like I'd get stuck in traffic or I'd wake up late, which is really funny because I, you know, I get up like stupid early and I'm ready to go and I'm such a morning person. 
but I would not be to my classroom when class started. And I would be like 20 minutes late, not like two minutes late where you go, yeah, okay. You probably shouldn't do that again, but like, it's okay. But like 20 minutes late. And I would always wake up and be like, oh, okay. It's only two 30. I still have hours to sleep. Like <laughs> It's all good. But that was so my, this isn't figurative for you. This is your question is literal. I just realized mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you had literal nightmares. I did. Yeah. I don't dream about hardly anything memorable. <laughs> they're just they're just bits and pieces of strange, obscure things <laughs> that are floating around in my brain. Oh man, I'm t- yeah, I'm sorry no, that for- you were tormented by those because those that must have felt. Good. All I had to do is just the guilt of not doing anything all summer and <laughs> wanting to keep on, keep on keeping on with that kind of schedule. Well, now that we're jumping back into it. Should we head to our next favorite part? What we're digging? Get your shovel ready. Can you dig it? <laughs> Here's a shovel. Can you dig it, fool? Can you dig it? Should we, should we talk about how we're rethinking this for at least this episode? Yeah. So something cool that we've had the opportunity to do is to start taking these podcasts and actually turn them into a professional learning opportunity for teachers. So we've only done this once. Teachers, administrators, I shouldn't just draw the line at teachers, really anybody who wants to learn. Educators. Yeah, learn and get credit for their learning. But we've taken our podcast with Dan Spencer and have kind of created some extended learning opportunities. And now we offer it as a free course that's completely online and a way for you to get sketches um, by listening to the podcast, which if you're hearing this, you already do. And then just doing a couple other things and and doing a little bit more thinking. So I feel like that's kind of what prompted it, right? Yeah. And check the show notes. Uh, We'll have a little bit more information on if you want to participate in that uh, podcast PD, Uh, you can join the course that's around uh, Dan's cast. And we're hoping to get a couple more episodes turned into some PDs. So that would be something you're interested in. It'll be in the show notes. But yeah, it's got us thinking about how uh, uh, how we think about these segments and how they integrate together and how they would set up those opportunities. So we're not going to drastically change the podcast in order to to fit the course needs, but thought that we would be intentional about sharing with you that that's out there and that's kind of an extra layer when we think about developing these casts. So with what we're digging this week, we thought, why can't it be anything that we're digging? Like chocolate milkshakes? (laughs) Chocolate milkshakes and... Espresso. All right. Anyway, more specifically, I cut you off. More specifically lately, we've been, we've been digging, we've been um, fangirling slash fanboying over Liz Cole, right? Yeah. And her Chirpoli framework, um, when the three E's are engagement, enhancement, extension, the Chirpoli framework is really about thoughtful teaching and learning, guiding and informing technology use versus technology use informing, you know, instruction. So I'm a a former student of Punya Mishra and TPAC framework has been core to my you know, in my educational background, and that's how I think about things theoretically. But when I first read Liz's work, something that jumped out at me was how it took the basic mindset of TPAC and brought it to a practical level, to thinking about how pedagogy, how instructional moves come alongside technology. Yeah, I think one of my favorite pieces of it and, you know, in digging into her book, Learning First, Technology Second, it's just this idea that, you know, sometimes technology is not going to, you know, necessarily engage, enhance, or extend, but how can we as teachers think about, well, it does help support my students in their learning. And so what kind of strategies can I add on to it to make it that much better. I think that's been really, really interesting too. I think a lot of teachers naturally do it, but I think it just gives a lot more credit to, you know, teachers have to be thinking about these things and and hopefully they are, and hopefully they can combine the best of, 
you know, their pedagogical knowledge as professionals with what something can do to help support student learning to just make it the best experience for students. So one of the things in the book that she starts off with is just this idea of false engagement. And I think we've talked about this a little bit before, Jeff, and and these ideas that, you know, before we, we all have these stories as teachers where we're like, oh, face palm moment. I put them in seating charts and I didn't even know the kids, right? Like there's those moments where you wish you would have done things differently. For me, when I was teaching, uh, we went one-to-one with iPads and we were so excited about it, but like really the whole thing was a little skewed because we were so excited about going one-to-one with iPads, but not necessarily thinking about the student learning that could occur. So I, I think there's already an issue there, right? Um, but then we were able to bring them into our classroom and people would say, why do you like them? Schools would come visit us and check out what we were doing. I was like, they're so engaging. And they were engaging, but it it wasn't necessarily engaging students in learning or engaging students in asking them to, you know, be able to do more than what they could do without the technology. So that's, that's my false engagement story. Do you have any that come to mind? Uh, Several bits and pieces of stories came to my mind while you were talking. One of them is just interactive whiteboard adoption in our district. Mm. And how, and I think it's important to not point the finger when you're talking about false engagement stories to keep it to yourself. Yeah. Uh, So I'll keep it to my situation. I had an interactive whiteboard my first semester as an educator. I was a uh, long-term sub. I enjoyed it, um, but I didn't use it a ton. And then I got hired full-time mid-year and went over to the other high school in the district and uh, was in a classroom that did not have one. And so I I petitioned and lobbied and and got a – they found one for me and put it in my room. And nowhere in the course of – my petitioning or even my interactions with administration and you know I even took it to just I had a good relationship with the with the tech department in the district and just talked with them at no point in time did I did I plead my case from an instructional standpoint it was mm-hmm. all like I need one it's uh it's January of 2009 uh, <laughs> all right. everyone, everyone, it's so weird to hear yourself talking about relevance and, 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 and everything like that, like almost a decade past. But, um, that was one that I look back on my inability or like my complete ignorance to communicating my why, mm-hmm. no matter what you do, no matter what you advocate for, you need to have a strong sense of your why. And that why always has to come back to um, what it's going to do for for learners, what it's going to do for setting you up for success for your learners. Right. So ultimately, I didn't need to have that interactive whiteboard to engage them in some of the ways that I would have them be engaged. Right. They, right. The, the laptops that I had at my disposal ended up being a much more powerful tool that I would gravitate towards and kind of relegate the the interactive whiteboard to novelty and projecting things for to instruct them where to go on their own devices. So Right. Well and I feel like that like the the novelty piece that you just mentioned wears off, right? So there's this engagement perhaps, but it's not a true sense of engagement and learning and really it's just that like that ooh shiny effect that eventually students are gonna be really over. <laughs> so we love you, Liz. I feel like like the random concert goer, like, we love you, Liz. We think your book is great. Uh, we should also mention that we were able to partner with Liz and create an online course around yeah. her book that uh, Learning First Technology Second um, that encapsulates the Triple E framework and its application. So check that out in the show notes and find the link to her book if you want to grab that too. 
Yeah. I mean, reading her book is awesome in and of itself, reading it and then having the chance to kind of like share your learning and get some of those like, Oh, I I advocated for this. And then it was not good stories off your chest and into the light and realize that everybody has them and that there are ways to make things better that even if you have already advocated for a certain piece of technology, how can you make it that much better? So it's, it's been a really cool experience to be part of that group. So for this episode, we were excited to hang out around the campfire with Sharon Murchie. Sharon's a high school English teacher in Bath Community School, so just outside of Lansing. And holy cow, does she have quite the teaching load. She has 11th grade English, 12th grade AP English Lit, public speaking, creative writing, junior and senior seminars. She's also a participant in the Chippewa River Writing Project and the Red Cedar Writing Project. And on top of all of that and being a mom, she also is a PhD student getting her doctor of ed tech at Central Michigan. So she is busy, but we're super grateful that she took some time out to chat with us about really awesome things in her classroom. How are you, Sharon? I'm doing well. Thank you. Since the podcast is called Campfire, we were wondering, did you go to summer camp as a kid? I did. Yeah. I went to a couple of different summer camps growing up, but yeah, a a week every summer was spent at camp. And what was that like? What was, what was the specifics of the camp that you went to? Um, it was church camp, uh, most of the time. And, um, so you stayed in a cabin with very creaky bunk beds and very old mattresses and you went canoeing and got poison ivy and played a lot of capture the flag and sang songs and ate questionable meals. Um, and <laughs> it sounds always, like the quintessential camp experience. <laughs> it really was. It really was. You always got a boyfriend that then was your boyfriend for, you know, a week or two after camp was over until you stopped writing letters. And yeah, did it every summer up through, I think, ninth or 10th grade. Oh, and I caught a lot of toads. Nice. These questionable meals usually mean it comes from like a huge GFS can. Yeah, there was like a big mess hall and I I don't even remember the food. I just remembered it tended to be orange. So yeah, I'm guessing those great big cans of like cheese sauce is probably what I'm remembering. Yeah, I, mostly I remember the the made a boyfriend every year and caught toads part. I'd keep them in a coffee can and then in the middle of the night, I would yell, hey, they just escaped. And that was usually good. And then, yeah, it was, it was an annual prank. You, you were that camper. <laughs> Apparently. I... That sounds awesome, Sharon. So Jeff was kind of giving me a little bit of the scoop. He's been raving about the 4T conference and your presentation was in one of them. So I know Jeff wants to kind of give a little segue into what his favorite aspects of that conference and, and your session in particular are. So I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Yeah. It, so your your session was around Genius Hour and it had the nice companion presentation from, was it? was it uh... Janet Nyer. Janet. Yeah, Janet Nyer. Janet, Northern Michigan. Woohoo! Yep. <laughs> I think Janet's was more specifically just design thinking, but like your your Genius Hour has plenty of the the elements of design thinking in it. And I think the thing that stood out for me is it, it was structured around CC standards. You were encouraging kids to have a lot of voice and choice and you encourage student agency. It's a very iterative process where students are developing, they're getting feedback from you or from peers. They're revising. They're engaging in feedback again. And it, it, you know, very iterative, but then it's well structured around standards that you're charged with supporting them with anyway. Right. Right. So I just kind of loved the design aspect of that. Students are driving learning in that scenario. And I got to think it goes beyond just your genius hour. I I think it's part of your practice as a whole where student agency and cultivating and growing student agency is is important to you. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about what learning behaviors do you expect 
from your students in this environment that that you're creating and fostering with them? Sure. Well, it's interesting because I'm a bit of an organizational control freak, but I am not a sage on a stage. I am not a stand in front of the room and lecture teacher by any means. Um, I'm very uncomfortable in that role. So the design of Genius Hour and the design of everything I do is really student led. I really try to be the guide on the side, but it's very structured. I'm very much a whole classroom teacher, but I'm a roving whole classroom teacher, if that makes sense. I'm yeah. very rarely in front of the room. If I am, it's a five minute vocab activity or I'm leading a discussion, but usually I'm just circling quite a bit and making sure that the students have the structure they need, but that they're really controlling um they're controlling what they're getting out of it. And I'm just there to push and poke and prod, if that makes sense. And so the genius hour repetitive structure that I use is is the same way. The students are doing the heavy lifting and I just keep poking them to try and get them to move a little bit or think a little bit differently or explore a different idea or I'll throw resources at them if they get stuck you know, I'll be like, oh, I just saw this or I just did this. In fact, they think that I have the most interesting Facebook feed in the world because I'm like, I just saw this on Facebook. <laughs> and it's always just I'm throwing them links of things to look at that help them then move, continue moving in their process. Did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just think that uh, personalized learning opportunities aren't just students decide everything and the alternative doesn't have to be teacher does everything right right the way that you see yourself if i'm interpreting it correctly is you organize the structures in which students are going to be challenged and are going to be prodded and it's not one or the other it's not teachers do or students do it's a shift in thinking and i appreciate that emphasis on you know, you could be a super organized person and that be a hallmark of your character and not be controlling of the activity that goes on in your room. Well, right. I'm, I shouldn't be doing all the thinking. The kids should be doing the thinking. They should be doing the heavy lifting. So if I'm working harder than anyone else, then that that doesn't make any sense. You know, I already have uh, credit in junior English. So so I'm really trying to get them to do the thinking and them to do the exploring. And that's part of why Genius Hour was something I really wanted to tackle because I do basically two research projects, two huge research papers, one first semester and one second semester. And Genius Hour is the first semester research paper. And this was a way to do it that felt authentic and that students were curious. They, they were driving the process. And my second semester research project is uh, a similar, similar but different. And again, students are doing the driving. That sounds like, I, can I come and sit in your classroom, Sharon? <laughs> that, Please, that, my door is always open <laughs> unless there's construction. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds, it sounds awesome. And I think, you know, like Jeff said, as I was in the classroom for 10 years and, and Genius Hour was just becoming really big as I was leaving. And there's definitely that concern of like, I want to give them the freedom to drive, but also there need to be some standards. I taught eighth graders, so we need to give them some guidelines and some ideas. So I guess I would love to hear like, what are, what are kind of like some systems that you were able to put in place to help students still be able to drive their learning, but at the same time, make kind of like course correct and guide so that they were in, you know, on the right track. So I think I have to kind of back up just a little bit to explain like how I even got to Genius Hour because the way that I carved out the 20% time then kind of explains how I how I designed that time, if that makes sense. I um I knew that I wanted to find this way 
to do this student-led semester-long research project. So what I did was pull every paper that my students wrote in a semester, and this is junior English. This is where I do it is in junior English, and I teach all the sections of junior English, and they're inclusive. So I have all levels of students, all the juniors in our school. So I pulled all the papers, including any research that they did, and all the standards that went through those. And then basically, anything that hit those standards, I tossed most of those assignments. So I got rid of web quests and any little sort of researchy thing and a lot of synthesis writing pieces because those standards I was going to hit during this semester long genius hour research. So that was my starting point. These are all the standards that I'm going to hit. Also, by pulling all of those pieces out, I realized that I actually had cleared up about 20% of the semester. So that was my 20% time right there was throwing out all those old projects. And I didn't throw out the literature, right? We're still doing the literature. That's the other 80% of the time is literature and writing structure. All of that is still there. But the 20% time was anything that was related to research and synthesis writing. So we do it on Fridays. Every Friday, the kids know it's genius hour. And I use a form that I created and I hand out to them in Google Classroom because Google Classroom is a lifesaver when it comes to turnaround time and paper grading for me. And so they have this form that asks five or six questions related to, you know, what types of things did you look at? Uh, what did you learn? What do you want to learn about it? How did this change your thinking or add to your thinking? What else do you want to learn about it? What might you want to write based on what you've learned? And they fill out that form every week and turn it into Google Classroom. I do a quick skim on it, give them a few comments, usually one or two comments. So A, they know that I've read it and B, I know what they're researching. And then I turn it back to them. And then the following week, they do the same thing and work on page two of the form. So all semester long, they work on a new page each week of this form as they continue to research. And we end up with this kind of side conversation on their doc, in the comments of their document through Google Classroom as they're researching. So I kind of get to be a part of the process a little bit, but also I'm just having this little conversation about, oh, that's so cool, or have you looked at this? Or it looks like you're stuck in this topic, do you wanna to jump topics? You know, to give them some encouragement and some feedback, and it really builds relationships, but also keeps them involved and excited in, in what they're looking at. And then as the semester goes on, they kind of get, in deeper, they really start to dig in and find something they're really passionate about. And then we go from there and they start to work on what they're eventually going to create, which is something that they publish on the internet, whether they start a blog or create a wiki or build a website, but they build something that incorporates all their research and that's their semester project grade is whatever that final piece is that they build. I feel like you're reading my mind because I was going to ask you, what's that final step? Like, how do they share it out? So I think it's it's awesome that you create this authentic audience for them. So I, I'm just really excited about it. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, by about week seven or eight or nine, I start asking them, you know, what did you want to find when you started researching, what was it you really wanted to find? And, you know, they'll say, well, I wanted to find a high school person's experience about dealing with an ACL injury, or I wanted to find an explanation of why mass murders happen, <laughs> right? You know, it, it, the sky's the limit on what they wanted to find. And then I say, well, then let's create that thing. What does that thing look like? You know, what is the mode of that writing? What is the voice or the point of view of that writing? Um, how would you cite your sources in that kind of writing? You know, so we look at, well, how does the Wall Street Journal cite their sources different from how does Wikipedia cite their sources? You know, are you doing something that is editorial? 
Are you doing, how does a blog cite its sources? So we talk about, you know, hyperlinks versus um, footnotes, you know, how that specific mode of writing incorporates their research and what kind of point of view and tone that piece of writing would have. What does it look like? And then, yeah, that they publish it, whether they use Weebly or Wix or Wikispaces or YouTube. Maybe they want to do uh, some sort of um, vlog. You know, what what is it that they they want that piece to look like? And they publish that and we link them all up to um, the class wiki so that there's kind of like a, a clearing house of every student's project and they can see each other's work. Yeah, and that's their that's their final project. And so it's authentic, but it's it's legitimate research. Um, and they're following the the mode, media, audience, purpose, and situation. Um, we use the format that uh, Dr. Troy Hicks writes about. So they they use that and really incorporate all those pieces and look at what that type of writing really should look like for an authentic audience. And they're excited because, you know, they realize that they just joined the conversation. They just created the thing on the internet that they wish they would have found. And that is really, I think, eye-opening for them to realize that they just joined the global conversation, you know, about the thing that they were passionate about. So it's, it's cool. It's really cool. And they buy in. It sounds like it's really empowering for them to, to realize that they can contribute to that. Not only, not only did they join it, but they have the capability and how cool is it that technology gives us, you know, gives them this, this platform to share their learning and their voice. Right. Yeah. Their voice, you know, they have something to say just because they're 16 and 17 years old doesn't mean they don't have something to say. They have something very meaningful to say. And, I think it's really, it's really powerful to realize that, I mean, I remember being 16 or 17, you know, no one understands you. No one listens to you. You're powerless. And all of a sudden you're like, no, here, this thing, this thing that you know, this is worth sharing. So it's really cool. Something that kind of strikes me, Sharon, as you're describing this is how Instructional scaffolds don't need to necessarily be um, uh, thought out a great deal of time in advance. How you're utilizing basically just follow-up inquiry, you really have positioned yourself as a partner in that learning process, much more than the technology itself. You talked about Google Classroom, but you really talked about the opportunity for conversation that Google Classroom enables and makes like practical for for you to be able to insert yourself in a gentle, uh, invisible hand way. Yeah, Google Classroom is just the tool. Um, and honestly, the reason that I rave about Google Classroom is because I can't get all the way around a computer lab or a classroom in a 50 minute class period and have a conversation with every student. Um, there's too many fires to put out, right? <laughs> there's too many other things that I have right. to do during a class period. So during a class period, I can still just be circling and helping. Um, but then the Google Classroom piece makes sure that I actually have that little bit of conversation with every single student whether or not I was able to stand over them <laughs> while they were researching on Friday. Um, so Google Classroom just offers me that tool to be able to, to do that. And because, because it's an, a very portable tool, I'm not having to deal with notebook paper, right? It just, <laughs> it frees up the notebook paper situation. So it's just, it's a great tool. It enables intimacy from a distance. Absolutely. It, yep. Those conversations can be had through the work itself. Um, and that's a that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, and it provides me the opportunity. You know, if they were handing in pieces of notebook paper, I wouldn't have the turnaround nearly as quickly just to have to go through them all and then hand them all back. It's just it's that much faster digitally. But also because I have the students write on the same document, just the next page of the same document all semester long, it's a catalog of everything they've looked at the semester and it's a catalog of our entire conversation that semester. 
Um, so they're not holding on to 18 pieces of notebook paper by the end of the semester or losing it as it would actually happen. They've got it in their they've got it in their drive. So it just provides some of those. I, I can, we can do more now in less time because of it. I think it's a really cool log of their learning and how their thinking has changed too, right? Like to think about reflecting back on one of their first or second logs right. versus where they got to. I think that is a is a huge process that um, you know, sometimes we we skip in education. We don't look at well, where where did you start at and how did you get to this point? So I think that's a, a really cool use of that too. Well, it also, yes, absolutely, because they can see where they started or, you know, if they looked at seven different things, they can go back through and say, oh, this one, I want to go back to that idea. But also it's a way for them to catalog all of their links because I have them um, throw in links to what they looked at each week. So at the end of 10 weeks, they've got 10 weeks worth of links they can get back to, too. You know, I remember writing research papers when I was in high school and I had like index cards or I don't even know. I I think I just made it all up. But (laughs) I was just so I used to teach high school world history and we would do a research paper. And I, you know, I kind of snagged the format from the language arts department. And I was as you were talking about this, I was thinking about all of the note cards that my kids had. And then, you know, they they'd lose one and the whole thing was like thrown and and then we had to go back and figure out well what did you have on that one so just in terms of like organizational but also i'm thinking about like classroom transition times just those really really simple things that you don't think about but if you can gain a couple minutes every class period because turning it in is plus pressing that blue button in the corner that says turn in versus you know 30 kids getting into your little turn it in bin i think there's some some very like logistical aspects that are really helpful as well right and and passing back papers which i'm terrible at doing so yeah all i do is you know yeah pass them back digitally and boom i'm done it's out of my hands whether they were in class or not Well, Sharon, I have a, I have a question for you. Then, um, do you want to play a little game with us? Uh, do I have a choice? Uh, sure, I, I promise really it'll be fun. It'll be fun. <laughs> no, I, I want this to be a genuine question, um, and and say no, because <laughs> then and then we'll go. Oh, okay. okay. Well, have a good day. <laughs> right. Um, no, sure, we, I'll play we promise it'll be fun. Usually we do trivia, but we're not even going to do trivia with you. Okay. This is a this is a new game, so usually we have some sort of like fun segment. Um, we we like to uh, think about the games that Jimmy Fallon does and and try to spin off of them. We're not always very good at it, but this game is an educational version of Would You Rather. Yeah. So you just have to choose one or the other, and um, we figured that we can all get a good chuckle thinking about which one we would rather have happened. So I'm going to go a little out of order of the way that I had the questions listed, but I think this one is going to really hit home with you. So the first would you rather is, would you rather lose every document in your Google Drive or lose all the contacts in your phone? Um, I would rather lose the contacts in my phone because I can find those people on Facebook. <laughs> that's, that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh my gosh, there are so many things in my Google Drive. Right? That if would I never lost be my Google Drive, that would be, yes. No, I actually worry about that because I'm also working at a PhD right now, which is also all sitting in my Google Drive. So if I were to lose my Google Drive, I would probably crawl under a rock for a week and then figure out how to regroup. Yeah, if I lost my contacts in my phone, um, anybody they really, that I really wanted to talk to, I could find again online. And everybody else, I hope they have a really nice life. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of an interesting question, too, because, like, the lose every th- document in your Google Drive insinuates that, like, Google's going to have a major malfunction or, like, uh, your uh, the storage from your uh, school domain is going to have just going to mess up for you, right? right? The lose all the contacts in your phone 
kind of is like you've only got them on your phone. But like if I lost my phone, I have all my contacts. Like they're they're all in my Google contacts, right? Right. Yeah. So it's Most like, of them I but, can find. But are I am are we insinuating that Google fails again and all my all my contacts are gone from my cloud too? Uh, but it's kind of an interesting like uh, thought when we're we're thinking about everything being in the cloud. There, like you might not necessarily be the one that uh, causes you to lose all that stuff. Yeah, and that is somewhat terrifying, right? <laughs> I thought about that with Dropbox too. I'm like, if Dropbox goes under, I'm gonna lose a lot. So, yeah, I have to just believe that it's there. You want me to read one of these? Yeah, Um, go for it, Jeff. You have a preference on which one? Take your pick, man. Okay. Would you rather have all your high school students forget their passwords or have a fire alarm pulled during uh, MSTEP standardized testing of some sort? You know what? I... The M step fails miserably because of some sort of glitch anyway. <laughs> so pull that fire alarm. We'll all get some fresh air. It's like April, right? Hopefully it's sunny. Yeah, pull the fire alarm because, you know, we just watched the little things circle for a while anyway. So maybe by the time we get back, it'll have logged in. <laughs> That's awesome. And those, those passwords, those students forgetting passwords is uh... – a nightmare. Well, I, I had uh, I had seventh graders, so it was just kind of like, I think the younger you get, the more of a nightmare passwords and credentials. Yeah, I tell my students they have to use their school username and school password whenever they log into anything for class. That way I don't get any weird, funky usernames being projected <laughs> out to the world. But also, if they forget their password... Um, then, you know, I or the IT person can uh, figure it out. <laughs> we have to, there's a master list. So, yeah, I don't let right. them make up their own usernames and passwords um, for several reasons. <laughs> All right. Third and final, would you rather, would you rather have your Wi-Fi go down during a lesson or have a student get a pencil stuck in their foot? <laughs> Oh dear. Um, again, the Wi-Fi goes down constantly. We're kind of used to to dealing with that, so I, it's it's a pain. It's frustrating, but hopefully, I've got something in my back pocket that we can do on the fly when the Wi-Fi goes down. So I would rather the Wi-Fi go down than a child have some sort of. Uh, injury even if it's graphite and not lead poisoning um yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll go shot. with the wi-fi going down <laughs> we're kind of used to that I'm, I'm glad that this was your response because it, it would it would hurt my heart to hear you say yeah it's all right if if kid gets hurt right? uh we just push him off to the side and as long as the wi-fi is going you know we'll go one person down <laughs> That's that's hilarious, but but no, we I'll I'll take broken Wi-Fi because again, you know, there's you have to be flexible, and I mean, if the Wi-Fi going down is the worst thing that happened in my day, that's really not that big of a deal. So that's a normal day for you. <laughs> that's a normal class. Yeah, yeah, that's a normal class, and you just regroup. And if if it doesn't come back up within a minute or two, then you pull something out of your back pocket. You know. It's it, my students used to be like, which which plan are we on now? Because I think we've been through A, B and C. I was like, yeah, right. well, we got some more letters. We're all good. Right. I'll make something else up. Yeah. I, I can always make something up that we can do that will be somehow meaningful. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I was thinking, OK, so on Friday during Genius Hour, if the Wi-Fi goes down and kids can't research, what would I do? Well, what's my goal? My goal is that they are researching and that they're writing about their research. So probably what I'd have them do is do a share around the room. What's the coolest thing you've learned so far in Genius Hour? Does anybody else know about this topic? Right. They can cite each other as sources. But, you know, we could have a whole class. We could have a a whole class discussion with no electricity whatsoever, and it would still be meaningful learning and engaging and sharing and interactive um, 
and it wouldn't be a lost class at all. You know, it would still be genius hour. So yeah, the, the tech is just the tool. Awesome. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for taking time out of your summer vacation to chat with us. I'm glad. Uh, it sounds like everything is good over there. No, like screaming children or injuries. Or no, so no, that's... there's been no bleeding. So uh, they're fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Well, we look forward to chatting with you again. Um, and yeah, just thanks. I know it's not easy to do as a teacher to find that time during summertime when you're trying to kind of like decompress and, and start to think about next year. But we really, we are grateful for you taking time. Oh, thanks for inviting me. It's been an honor. Hello there. Today, we want to talk to you about asking questions because asking questions is a good way to find out about things like, uh, like, Cookies. Yeah. Observe. All right. So in our what we're digging segment, we chatted about technology and the idea of a false sense of engagement. And we're interested to know from you. We're kind of flipping the script a little bit on Campfire Cues uh, after our summer hiatus. So we're asking you this question. Do you have a false engagement story? And if you do. Tell us about what you would do differently. How would you make it better to put learning first, technology second? Tell us your thoughts. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, can phone, <laughs> snap us. If you do MySpace, we won't know about it. So don't do anything <laughs> that is from a decade ago. Uh, and or, do. or, or do. Uh, if, if you see if Aaron or I face to face, you. you could even tell us. What's that? I said, or or do if if MySpace is still like, is MySpace still even in existence? I don't even know. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure you can get on MySpace awesome. and do that. Uh, and awesome. if you get on there and we're not there, then we'll have to uh, redouble our efforts to be there. But put awesome. Campfire Q in as a hashtag. And that's if it's a social media platform that has a hashtag. <laughs> And uh, and and so that we can see it. Uh, our our thought here is l let's let's change this a little bit. Let's hear you respond to a question that we ask, um, and do it a little differently. We usually take questions from you or try to field questions from you and respond ourselves. Um, but maybe this will be um, an opportunity to see how uh, how engaging that is for you to respond to there. We're just switching up all sorts of things today. Yeah, yeah. We figure why why not? Nothing sacred. Well, well maybe there are sacred things. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe a couple. It's, it's, we love chatting with teachers. We got to keep that part right. Yeah, yeah. We'll keep we'll keep talking to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> I think it's time to start to say see you later. But thank you for listening. Remember that the show notes are always full of more information, especially for this episode. There's lots of links that we'd love to be able to share out with you. Don't forget to answer the campfire Q hashtag campfire Q. I'm like doing the hashtag sign with my hands here. We um, all see you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and we'd love it if you would subscribe or leave us a review on iTunes. I'll see you later, man. Enjoy the sunshine while I enjoy the rain. Will do.